Good afternoon. Can people hear me? I, I had reports that there was some difficulty hearing in the back. Is this okay? My name is Mark Stern. I'm a professor of social policy and history here at Penn and co-direct the Urban Studies Program. And I'm uh, chairing this panel on uh, social rights and domestic labor, a topic that we've already gotten into a bit. Uh, it's ironic that DCC has focused on social citizenship the same year that Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century became a bestseller. Uh, you'll recall that T.H. Marshall noted that the spread of social citizenship was contingent on the reduction of inequality during the early years of the 20th century. Uh, and that certainly has now largely been reversed. In place of Marshall's evolutionary vision of the steady advance of social rights, we now live in a world in which the curtailment of those rights is the order of the day because, as they say, there is no alternative. This session's paper focuses on another weakness in Marshall's system, the role of care work. Marshall always seemed to use the male pronoun and assumed that the advance of citizenship would not fundament fundamentally change uh, the nature of social reproduction. But the expansion of the civil rights to African Americans, women, people of disabilities, besides its more obvious implications, changed the terms under which those who could not fend for themselves received care. Both papers suggest that mobilization provides a means for expanding the social rights of care workers, although neither ends up reinforcing Marshall's optimism about social rights' inevitable triumph. Jennifer Klein is professor of history at Yale University. Professor Klein's research spans the fields of US labor history, urban history, social movements, and political economy. Her publications include Caring for America, Home Healthcare Workers in the Shadow of the Welfare State, uh, co-authored with Eileen Boris, which was awarded the uh, Sarah A. Whaley Book Prize from the National Women's Studies Association. And for all of these rights, Business, Labor, and the Shaping of America's Public-Private Welfare State, which won the Ellis Hawley Prize in Political History, Political Economy from the Organization of American Historians, and the Hagley Prize in Business History from the Business History Conference. Her paper, paper is entitled Civic Belonging and Social Rights, Contesting Coercion and Building Capacity in the Care Work Economy. Pramila Nadison is an, uh, sorry, uh, is an associate professor of history at Queens College uh, in the City University of New York system. Her book, Welfare Warriors, The Welfare Rights Movement in the United States, uh, won the 2005 John, John Hope Franklin Publication Prize awarded by the American Studies Association for the best book in American studies. Her paper today focuses on her recent research on the history of social legislation related to domestic workers. It is entitled The Social Rights of Domestic Labor. Robin Leidner, uh, Associate Professor of Sociology at Penn, whose work also focuses on work and gender, will serve as discussant. So, Jennifer. Can I put this down? All right. So the historians, I guess, will give you a break from the uh, PowerPoints. But anyway, thank you for having me. And I'd like to thank the organizers who did all the work um, for pulling this together. And uh, glad we could actually have this conversation and, and start to produce some, some new understandings about rights and citizenships and even whether we need to move beyond um, that concept in this language since we're fairly in dire straits <laughs> at the moment. So anyway, commemorating the death of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th of 1988, 100 Los Angeles home care workers marched to demand union recognition. This is Memphis all over again. Civil rights leaders address the mostly female and minority crowd. We are saying again today, we are somebody. We're men and women who deserve to be treated with dignity. Grassroots leader Esperanza de Anda remembered, quote, we were the invisible workforce. A decade later, home care workers throughout California and Oregon asserted, invisible no more. 
a phrase that demanded the social recognition and economic rights that had so long been accorded to wage workers, at least since the 1930s. Home aides and attendants perform the intimate tasks of daily life, such as bathing, brushing teeth, dressing, cooking, and cleaning, that enable aged, disabled, or chronically ill people to live decent lives at home. These are America's frontline workers, caregivers, but they earn an average hourly wage lower than that of all other jobs in healthcare and historically have labored without the security of employment, social benefits, or even workers' compensation. They labor in private spaces to meet individual needs and family needs. But how they do so is a story of political economy, one that reflects the major shifts in the American welfare state um, and you know, the economy more generally. Home care aides make up a vast workforce of over two million workers, much larger than those of the iconic industries of auto and steel that link our most challenging social issues, an aging society, the enormous medical sector and its ability to prolong life, the neoliberal restructuring of public services, immigration, disability rights, the prospects of health care for all, and the potential of a new American labor movement. Home care is currently the fastest growing occupation in the nation, adding hundreds of thousands of positions at a steady clip numbering, as I say, almost two million, and the, you know, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics projects this growth through 2020. These low-wage workers stand at the center of a care work economy defined by a continuum of jobs, hospital workers, nursing home workers, child care workers, um, substance abuse social workers, counselors, school lunchroom aides, teachers aides of various sorts, and social and human services assistants and specialists. These jobs, of course, are increasingly important also because they cannot be offshored. Wherever capital might migrate globally, these jobs are here. And, as it was with the case with manufacturing a century earlier, waves of new immigrants continually replenish these jobs. So consequently, women's labors, once considered marginal um, to the market or outside of the market, at the periphery of economic life, have now actually become the strategic sites of workers' struggle and the direction and character of the American labor movement. Now, in our book, Caring for America, Eileen Boris and I try to rethink the history of the American welfare state from the perspective of care work. Social policies are not just income transfer programs. They also depend on a particular configuration of labor that facilitates support on a daily basis. Government has had a central role in creating labor markets in human and social services. Broad trends in the U.S. social policy over the uh, latter half of the 20th century fostered the creation of new occupations funded by the state and actively channeled particular workers into these jobs, especially poor and minority women deploying and perpetuating racial and gender inequality. So home care has existed, though, in this kind of nether world between public and private family care and employment. It was possible because of the devaluation of women's work and the stigmatization attached to the labor of poor women of color. But we try to argue it's not just, uh, the labor is not just a value because of its ascribed racial or gendered meanings, but because of the way the state chooses to structure it. The outcome is historical rather than epiphenomenal. The devaluation is not only ideological, but has been the product of a conflict between um, and an accommodation between experts, state authorities, care receivers, workers, and institutions since the New Deal. Um, so although, although they're laboring in these private spaces, we try to think about how this is part of the public realm. And their struggle to unionize actually began in the 1960s, but really the organization of this African-American and Latino workforce, you know, in its early moments um, among middle-aged women exploded in the last quarter of the 20th century. Um, and I think what's interesting to look at this is because they're outside of basic American labor law, they're outside both the NLRA, National Labor Relations Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, 
Um, they had to experiment with new structures of representation and distinct forms of unionism. They had to figure out, you know, how do you devise legal and political strategies for an era in which governments denied that they were the employers responsible for poverty wages um, or 12-hour shifts, and the National Labor Relations Board election was too often a dead end, and even courts refused coverage of the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act. As well, before caregivers could even bargain for better conditions, they had to come to recognize themselves as workers and fight for that recognition by the public, the state, and the very users of their services. Um, and so uh, we, we write about several different unions and several different models of organizing, which I'll get to, but SEIU in the main, the Service Employees International Union, really figured out, first of all, that Although this was private labor, really they were going to have to fight this battle on the terrain of the welfare state and really go um, to the state for enabling legislation and funding of services. And also that it was going to take a form of community organizing and political unionism working together to improve the lives of home health care workers. Now given this symposium's focus, I thought that for today, I would aim to put together two very different paradigms about care into conversation with each other and see if we can arrive at some new understanding that offers um, a way to confront the social imperatives of care conceptually and strategically. As has been well you know, covered over the last decade or two, the social benefits extended by the modern welfare state created an unprecedented level of economic security and political enfranchisement. Um, and plenty of scholarship has equally sought to consider the gender differential of such social citizenship, especially where welfare benefits have, welfare state benefits have been so tightly tied to employment, as in the case of the United States. So then what happens is this longer historical question ends up being sort of, okay, so what would be the route by which women would eventually get there? Or how long would it eventually take them to get there to that definition of social citizenship? But I wanted to use home care maybe to try to go in a different direction here. In contrast to um, that sort of social citizenship teleology, Evelyn Nakano Glenn has recently written about home-based labor, particularly care, as trapped within interlocking systems of coercion, that it emerged not only from earlier forms of indentured, unfree, or obligated labor, but is a crucial element of such labor. And further, that law and social policy compel care to remain low paid or unpaid because they adhere to undergirding assumptions of family law um, and marriage. And Russell talked about this as well as a status obligation by virtue of women's status as wives or mothers or daughters, or as a property claim resting on a servant's caste position as subalterns. The other thing I wanted to try to get at, if I can, is writing from a philosophical um, perspective and disability studies is Martha Nussbaum's work on capabilities and the idea of capabilities for human flourishing that could lead toward a just society, beginning with the notion that human beings cooperate out of a wide range of motives, the capabilities model seeks to locate ethical, social, and institutional grounds on which bodily need and the need for care are essential to dignity, not in contrast to it. So, um, so I want to see, you know, there are certainly elements of coercion, but there are ways in which workers and even social workers and welfare administrators, I think, try to, um, try to work against that and try to come up with other definitions and then see where the, um, where the capabilities model um, has worked. So to begin with, home care as a distinct occupation emerged during the, great, the crisis of the Great Depression to meet both welfare and health imperatives. One strand took shape as welfare relief for unemployed African American women who previously had labored in domestic service. The New Deal, what they did was, um, you know, looking at families uh, where a woman had small children but she was somehow incapacitated, either in the hospital or um, at home with a chronic illness and couldn't care for the children, the state would send a substitute mother into the home. This was called homemaker service, 
And it would also allegedly substitute for the, quote, Bronx slave market, where women had to stand out waiting for day labor to pick them up. This was run under the auspices of the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Relieving public hospitals of the long-term elderly and chronically ill patients became the other origin of state-supported home-based care. The WPA initiated programs to move people out of the hospital and give them the necessary assistance to remain independent at home. These programs called the workers housekeepers, reflecting the non-medical designation of workers in hospital settings. In either case, though, social workers within welfare agencies oversaw the provision of care as a service for indigents. Not only the workers, but the clients um, who obtained eligibility had to be destitute. So the workforce resembled that of domestic service, middle-aged African-American women, most of whom were married and supported family members. And a murky line certainly separated the visiting housekeeper from the domestic servant. And to the, so to this extent, this kind of legacy of slavery um, hovered around the job. Well, while the New Dealers developed this as a form of relief, um, for both providers and receivers, New Deal labor law and social policy ignored the resulting workforce. So when the Democratic Congress passed old age insurance, unemployment benefits, collective bargaining, minimum wages and maximum hours under FLSA, it excluded nurse companions, homemakers, and other in-home care workers. So what's important here? The New Deal left a threefold legacy which persisted through the rest of the century. Although tied to the medical sector, states would pay for home-based care through the welfare agencies, but often with federal funds. Secondly, policy experts and welfare administrators saw female public assistance recipients as the ready supply of labor for home care. Subsequent programs would consistently target and direct such women into these jobs. Um, and so uh, this coercive element of welfare policy. And third, the exclusion of home attendants from national wages and hour law remained in place well into the 21st century. In fact, till about six months ago. Um, so focused initially on children, uh, families with children, this would eventually grow into an old age service. Following World War II, private family agencies um, picked up on doing this. The Children's Bureau found ways to fund it through um, the public. And again, they remained focused on public aid recipients as the people who would go into these jobs. But they imagined that this would be a public job. And in fact, in places like New York City, it did become a public sector job. Um, so the other thing, though, is this um, ideology of rehabilitation that the administrators of these programs created. And so they thought, okay, if we could take elderly or disabled people who live in institutions and have them live at home, this would end their dependence on the state. And by having somebody coming in to take care of them, that would rehabilitate them, and they would become independent as citizens should be. At the same time, they looked at poor women on public assistance and said, oh, if we can move them into these wage work jobs, it will rehabilitate them as women, mothers, and workers, and they will become independent through this kind of, through this kind of rehabilitation. Of course, these were jobs that were outside of minimum wage if they were you know, not in the public sector. And so, um, so basically, policymakers from that point on, never shook their faith that moving women into these jobs in domestic labor would rehabilitate them as workers. This continued through the war on poverty. It's quite interesting, there was a program called New Careers, um, which was supposed to offer people you know, training in paraprofessional jobs that they would move up. But basically what they did was they created more homemaker programs, more housekeeper programs, renamed it home aid, home attendant. And so in fact, the new career turned out to look like a lot like the old career. 
Um, so then what happens is in 1974, there's going to be, uh, finally Congress goes back to revise the Fair Labor Standards Act and do an amendment and add domestic workers. And so this is finally going to be this huge civil rights gain for um, African American women, for poor women who work in the household. And at this very moment, Congress cut out um, the care workers. And they did this by a, defi a definitional ruse that reduced the home aid to an elder companion. So in the conversations that took place in Congress, they, they equated this person with a companion or a sitter who was like a friendly visitor who just came in to watch. And of course, the term watch implied something very passive and not real work. Um, and then they, the Department of Labor codified this exemption of a companion from the Fair Labor Standards Act amendments. Now that term elder companion had never actually existed before or was not in use. It was put into use at this moment. And in fact, now all these home care agencies insist on it as, no, but these are elder companions. So it becomes very entrenched. Um, and I think shows what Evelyn O'Connell Glenn was talking about, how they get equated with this quasi-family member, also as R Russell um, had referred to. And this happens just as you're about to get the takeoff of a for-profit industry after 1976. So, um, you know, after that, essentially the new for-profit industry is guaranteed a cheap labor force. So the response in organizing, which I'll go through really quickly, um, we've identified, you know, it's, there are these challenges that even as the welfare state location of the labor, being especially in welfare agencies, poverty um, policy, devalued the workforce, it, often, it also opened up a new site of social and political struggle. How these women could gain a measure of political and economic power in spite of all the structural, ideological, and political obstacles. Now the story is a complicated one because they face this ever-shifting structure of an evolving welfare state. Um, structurally, unions had to find um, home care workers um, and deal with the reality that the jobs were so dispersed. While there were tens of thousands of workers out there, um, there was no common work site. Most workers never saw each other, and they didn't even, many of them didn't even have any idea that there were other people doing this job. Um, in addition, the work is different. It is relational. It creates interdependence. Such work does not consist, or it consists of more than tasks completed. It doesn't produce something that can be quantitatively um, measured or easily represented in GNP. Essential to the job is emotional labor, affection, building trust. Workers cannot simply go on strike and leave clients who are unable to get out of bed. And after spending many hours, weeks, or even years with a client, the job may suddenly end with the death of the person cared for. And so part of the worker's struggle is you know, establishing the legitimacy of care itself in a way that defies our very taken for granted notions of work as production. So, and then the political question of how do you build a labor movement of poor people in a service so heavily dependent on public funding? So we identified um, a series of organizing strategies that responded to the structure of home care since the 60s. First, organizing took place among homemakers as employees of social welfare departments. And that was the case up until the early 70s. And then, for example, New York City privatized them once they became a militant public union. Um, second, organizing occurred among welfare recipients um, led by the independent living movement, which lobbied for payments for home care services. But by winning a service-based model based on cons a consumer um, provider, this actually made it very difficult um, ultimately for workers to be unionized because it turned them into independent providers rather than employees of any recognizable agency. A third organizing strategy took place through the service sector, through SEIU, um, through coalition building and community organizing and political unionism. And a fourth strategy tried to pursue a legal challenge of figuring out if they could get workers defined as employees for the sake of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, the legal track produced a, two results. Um, restructuring the state through public policy, 
For example, creating something called a public authority in California, which would act as an employer of record to bargain with, and I can speak later about the, the pros and cons of that, um, and a series of court cases that resulted in the unsuccessful 2007 Supreme Court case, Evelyn Koch versus Long Island Home Care, which upheld this companionship exemption, in fact, in a unanimous decision. Um, so I wanted to use the example of Chicago, but I'm just going to go through that really quickly because I know that I'm running short on time and I wanted to get to the, you know, the capacities thing because that's what I wanted to really talk about. But the unionism there was actually started by ACORN in 1983 um, and it's United Labor Unions, ULU. And what ACORN really did was they had um, uh, a kind of sectoral analysis that linked low-wage workers with those on public assistance, including poor single mothers, and they tied together workplace issues with community issues. It, so it's not just about wages and working conditions, but also about housing, discriminatory banking, um, living wage campaigns. And so they immediately politicized these workers. And they begin to organize them politically to make demands on um, the agency they work for. Um, and so actually, the first place they, they go to was this agency called National Home Care System, which in fact originally was called McMaid, um, which will tell you something about you know, the hybrid origins of this and coming out of the casual sector. And so they went in and they, they announced themselves in, a, in an action and said, we're here. We are this union, and we demand recognition. So um, in this case, they actually were able to get an NLRB election, but then um, everything kind of bogged down on the contract stage. And you know they can't go on strike, really, because they don't want to leave their clients. But what they threaten to do is move clients to a different agency or tell the state that they're a bad employer. And then that becomes costly for the state. Um, so through using the tactics of welfare rights organizing, going out to the employer's home and picketing there, learning to be political subjects, lobbying at the state house, doing all kinds of really creative action, they win a contract. But then there are all these other workers for the Department of Rehabilitative Services, sorry, that was the Department of Aging, for the Department of Rehabilitative Services who are independent providers serving the disabled under 65. And, um, and so the state could claim they're not our employees, and of course they're not employees of vendors. But again, what they do is bring those people in, organize them politically, and keep putting so much heat on the state that they actually do push up the wages, they actually do push up the conditions, and they really begin to change the balance of power. And um, national home care systems begins to work with them. And so I think we can see here that, in fact, they figure out a way to genuinely begin to get themselves recognized as people who have rights, who are political agents, who can win um, security and um, create alliances with disability, um, disability folks and work together. It's not always an easy alliance, which I'll get to um, in a minute. So I want to talk about the capabilities idea. So for sure, caring labor must be valued. But it's not clear that in and of itself, this principle is fundamental enough to change the structures and ideology of a society that has for so long been based on multiple exclusions and now growing power imbalances. The organizing has made strides in countering economic inequality. In Chicago, you know, they start off making $3.35 an hour, you know, and barely below minimum wage, they're up to $13 an hour um, in Illinois um, and also in the Bay Area. But anyway, the, so it's made strides also in winning social inclusion. But the interaction between workers and those who need and receive care has persistently been set up as a zero-sum equation. It's assumed that either wages are low, and so access is broader, or if wages and compensation rise, then access is cut off. And not only does this privilege the needs of recipients, because they need care no matter what, or have to have it no matter what, but it also demands self-sacrifice and self-denial on the part of the workers. So their capacities are thereby diminished. <clears throat> 
The interrelations of care should be some of our most important human connections, yet they so often get bound up with frustration, anxiety, and profound feelings of powerlessness and lack of autonomy from each side, recipient, family, provider, social worker. There is this perception that someone else has power and power that will leave them short change. So clearly we need to reimagine how to change the, the current arrangement of social relations. So in her model of capacities, Martha Nussbaum is interested generally in what makes lives of human dignity and human flourishing possible. Care, as most of us who write about would say, should be a primary entitlement. But as Nussbaum contends, this means fully departing from, or departing from John Rawls' notion of fully cooperating citizens and contractarianism. So she begins with Amartya Sen, who proposed replacing this Rawlsian list of goods based on income, wealth, and resources as indices of well-being with a list of capabilities, all of which could then be used for measuring quality of life. And they begin with the general principle that variations in need occur over the course of every human life. Quote, we are needy temporal animal beings who begin as babies and end often in other forms of dependency. Human beings are dignified and needy. So we need a list of capabilities um, uh, and, and she's looking at it in terms of people who have disabilities or impairments and their civic and social inclusion. And so she asks us to look at this in terms of human sociability, and this includes symmetrical relations and asymmetrical um, relations. And so from that point, vantage point of the, the impaired person or the cared for, she talks about you know, health, economic potential, well-being, um, uh, but also social time together, connection to other human communities. And so I want to think about what if we broaden this to think about the vast workforce of paid care workers. Because I think if I've read her correctly, it strikes me as her, as she lays it out, a very individualistic understanding of care, even while we're seeking political principles that offer dignity or respect to all citizens. It speaks of guarantees and shoulds, but not social struggle. And so the question of how we might get there is not really addressed. Um, and so if, you know, in addition to bodily health and in bodily integrity, imagination, play, the senses, and thought, if two elements on this capabilities list stand out, one, control over one's political and material environment, and also social interaction and connection um, to a human community, then I think that um, the kind of organizing the movement of home care workers over the last two or three decades has struggled over precisely these elements. And it's through such collective action and new solidarities that they have won um, the ability to enjoy a greater range of capabilities. In the face of these structural and ideological impediments, they have devised quite creative means of reconciling civic belonging, the interrelatedness of care, and the possibilities for dignity. And so I'm, I'm out of time, but I have interviews in here, oral history interviews, where people talk about, when they talk about the union, what they talk about is the way in which it brought them out of their, their singularity and out of their home and gave them people to talk to, gave them people to tell their stories to, um, made them part of a community, enabled them to speak not just for themselves, but for a larger group of people. They talk about this in political terms, they talk about it in social terms, and they talk about it in ethical terms. Um, and so, um, so anyway, let's see, because I'm skipping all these pages. Um, so I think one final point I want to make about that is um, while acknowledging that human beings are inevitably interdependent, Nussbaum still places the emphasis on moving from dependence to independence at, quote, whatever level their condition allows. But I think this is where home care workers and the current domestic workers movement parts way. Because I think they want to puncture the myth of independence and really push to the fore the, the really significant um, recognition of interdependence. So, um, so anyway, this is my final point. I'm going to say 
Wondering whether learning to talk about, so I'm wondering whether learning to talk about capabilities in this social, and yes, utopian way, might push us beyond this sticking point that destabilizes the political alliances, because there are moments where the workers have really been able to ally with the disability folks, with the senior citizens, and you know, when they're in a crisis, push for something. But then you hit these moments where the disability people are really reluctant to ally with them and say, this is gonna cost us. If your wages go up, we're not going to get our hours. If you don't show up, who's going to get me out of bed? Who's going to get me a shower? And so the rights talk often ends up, you know, brushing, you know, really hitting up against each other. And so I'm wondering if now in thinking in terms of capabilities, um, the outcome doesn't have to be productivity. Um, we can start to think more in terms of the social and economic activities that help us all lead longer, freer, and more fruitful lives. And this is really what we're going to have to do now because there is also a current assault that has been open not only at the state level where Republican governors, governors have, as we've seen in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio, are stripping the collective bargaining rights of these workers, starting with the home care workers the weakest link, because they're not real workers, and going after all the public sector workers, um, which they've done by taking away their collective bargaining rights. But now there's a Supreme Court case that just was heard in January of this year. The decision will be ha handed down imminently. Um, Harris v. Quinn, which aims to take away the collective bargaining rights of the home care workers in Illinois, but is using this as a foot in the door to take away collective bargaining rights from all public sector workers. And part of the argument that they use is to go back to saying, these are just moms, these are families, the family is a private space. Interestingly, the lead plaintiff is white. The union they're going after is primarily African American. And so I think we're back to this question of can social rights and a society that promotes dignity for all be realized when care is pushed back into the shadows and the home is closed off again? Thank you. Um, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me today um, and also thank all of you for being here. Um, social rights um, is something that's been talked about here. This conference is often talked about in terms of the decline of social rights since the emergence of a neoliberal economic state. Uh, and I think part of what I want to look at today is the way in which there have always been exclusions and inequalities in the category of social rights. So it's not only a product of neoliberalism. Um, so I want to look at how the exclusions and the inequalities have shifted in the US in particular from a liberal state to a neoliberal state. Uh, in 1974, domestic workers won an important victory with passage of amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act, which provided them with a minimum wage and overtime pay. The legislation brought domestic work, an occupation that was dominated by African American women, some of the benefits of social rights of labor after almost 40 years of exclusion. African American domestic workers who established a nationwide movement to upgrade the occupation were instrumental in the passage of the law through their lobbying efforts. They made their claims for labor rights based on the long history of African American women's confinement to domestic labor as well as they, the value that they associated with this labor. Their campaign was rooted in an attempt to rectify race and gender inequity in the law and reflected a broader push for substantive social and economic reform that marked the post-war period. It's a powerful example of a marginalized sector pushing for social, in for social inclusion and equality uh, and relying on liberal democratic claims of universal rights to bolster their support for, for their political claims. This paper examines the struggle by private household workers for exclusion into the social rights of citizenship. And I use the term social rights here, relying on the work of T.H. Marshall, to refer to state-based and protected economic rights. 
In the U.S., social citizenship rights were largely tied to employment status in the form of minimum wage social security benefits and unemployment compensation. Certain employment categories, however, uh, such as domestic work, were excluded from the social rights of labor when these laws were passed in the 1930s. And I hope to place, domestic work, uh, place the domestic worker rights campaign for minimum wage protection in the context of broader struggle for labor rights in the post-war period and look at how domestic workers' collective claims for social rights differed from other individually based efforts to move up the occupational ladder. I also examine critically the mixed legacy of the FLSA victory for domestic workers. Most labor struggles in this period, in the 1960s and 70s, centered on equal access to employment and an end to discriminatory practices. So civil rights and feminist activists waged a legal campaign to open previously closed occupations and support individual claims for inclusion. So activists relied on things like the Civil Rights Act and the Equal, Oppor and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to fight for inclusion into occupations with racial and gender barriers. Domestic workers, on the other hand, sought to upgrade their jobs and change the terms of social citizenship by extending the rights of labor to their current occupation. They were less concerned about individual access to new jobs but they aim to transform the political and economic status of an entire occupation and gain federal recognition of their work. Perhaps in a way contributing to rethinking equality in terms of care work or dependency as Ava Kate calls upon us to do. The claim for collective rights as domestic workers was rooted uh, in part in African American women's long association with the occupation. Domestic workers spoke of the value of this labor as well as the racial and gender inequity in labor law. And through alliances with feminist and civil rights organizations, they won minimum wage protections for this excluded sector in 1974. Equally important, the struggle by household workers illustrates how the move towards equality was often undermined by cultural practices and policies that generated new forms of inequality and social distinctions. In contrast to perspectives that see the FLSA amendments as a victory because they legally recognized home-based work, I argue that the FLSA reveals the limitations of the meaning of citizenship and illustrate how race, class, gender, and citizenship status defined those limitations. The character of the occupation, its association with women's unpaid labor in the home, uh, the very location of the work in the domestic sphere, and a workforce that was largely women of color ensured continued social and cultural marginalization. The isolated nature of the work and vulnerability of workers also fostered a power imbalance between employer and employee that made enforcement of the law very difficult. At the same time, the state established administrative practices and found new ways to differentiate among domestic workers, and this made the law much less effective. So despite the law's passage and the, pro and the promise of including more people in the rights of social citizenship, many household workers were excluded by other means. Nevertheless, the victory laid the foundation for the social rights of domestic workers, uh, which was a basic commitment to, equal to, to equity that would fuel later struggles for domestic worker rights. Domestic workers, uh, or domestic work in the U.S. was and is uh, a degraded occupation, in large part because of the racialized workforce made up overwhelmingly of women of color and immigrant women. By 1940, African American women were 60% of domestic workers. At the same time, culturally and politically, the occupation was bound up uh, with the history of racial inequality and slavery. As paid domestic workers, African-American women were treated more as servants than as workers, and it were expected to, to demonstrate both submissive behavior and offer emotional as well as physical labor. 
the racialized trope of the mammy, constructed perceptions of domestic workers as loyal servants without families or needs of their own, ready to care for and devote themselves to white employers. In addition, the location of the work in the domestic sphere made it hard to both recognize and regulate domestic work. Since the emergence of industrial capitalism, the home was constructed as a, not as a site of labor, but as a space divorced from the harsh competitiveness of the marketplace. So the work that took place in the home was associated with, with women's unpaid household labor and was not considered real work, but a labor of love. This framing of the domestic sphere led to assumptions that household employees were not workers, but were one of the family and needed no labor protections. Vivian Hart uh, referred to the home as a, quote, rights-free enclave, where the artificial public-private divide justified minimal state interference or any notion of labor standards. The disrespect accorded to the work uh, and lack of regulation fostered a situation where domestic workers were often underpaid, uh, had no job security, and little bargaining power. The lesser status of domestic work was both reflected in and constructed through its historical exclusions from labor law in the 1930s. Labor rights were a cornerstone of government reforms in the midst of the Great Depression and guaranteed many workers basic economic support, such as minimum wages, overtime pay, unemployment insurance, social security, um, as well as the right to organize and bargain collectively. This was an important shift in government policy that extended social citizenship rights to American workers and offered a safety net to the poor. But the New Deal also fostered inequality within the working class by reinforcing and recreating the racialized and gendered hierarchy of the labor market. Those without regular paid employment qualified for less generous benefits. But even among those who worked full time, not all contributions to the labor market were equally valued. The white male industrial employee became the prototypical worker that informed assumptions about what constituted legitimate work. Much of the paid work performed by women and African Americans, uh, including agricultural and domestic work, did not receive the benefits of social citizenship, establishing what historian Eileen Boris calls the racialized gendered state. So even as the United States seemed to embrace a more robust citizenship through the expansion of social welfare policy, legislators embedded race and gender stratification in the category of social citizenship. The reforms of the 1930s were rooted in a circumscribed definition of labor, which was institutionalized and written into federal law. Private household and other excluded workers were legally constructed as a distinct group of workers, um, or we could even say non-workers, a subjectivity that household employees would later use to mobilize on behalf of their rights. The exclusions of domestic workers from labor law illustrates how social practice and government regulation worked against the rhetoric of equality and democracy that has animated American political discourse and how new categories of labor were created through law. The disjuncture between the practice and promise of universal rights created an opening for domestic worker activists to push for substantive claims to equality based on the value of their labor and the history of racial and gender exclusion. So in the 1960s, in the late 60s and early 70s, domestic workers mobilized to transform the conditions and to advocate for social rights, uh, such as minimum wage and the right to organize and bargain collectively. Local groups in cities such as Atlanta, Detroit, New York, and Cleveland fought for bargaining power with employers. Uh, they wanted contract-based employment as well as greater respect and dignity for their work. They insisted, for example, on being called household technicians rather than servants and instituted training and professionalization programs to raise the status of their labor. They held forums, they distributed literature that delineated workers' rights and responsibilities. They even, orga uh, they even organized something they called Maid's Honor Days to bring recognition to their work. 
The various local groups came together in 1974 and formed the Household Technicians of America, which had 41 affiliated chapters and a membership of 25,000. Their campaign for minimum wage protection challenged normative racial and gender assumptions about work that were enshrined in the New Deal. For domestic workers, the marginal status of their occupation and its exclusion from the Fair Labor Standards Act were an indication of unequal treatment, a history of state-based racism, as well as a long-standing devaluation of the work of social re reproduction. They sought to bring the same kinds of protections to domestic work that was afforded to other forms of labor. For some, the legal recognition would uh, vindicate labor performed by generations of African American women, their very own mothers, grandmothers, sisters, and aunts. For others, it validated work they genuinely enjoyed, as Atlanta-based domestic worker and activist Dorothy Bolden explained, I love this work, I really love this work. Domestic workers were part of an upsurge of activists claiming economic rights in the 1960s and 70s. Many African American women leaving domestic service undoubtedly fought for uh, access to other kinds of employment and for equality within those workplaces. But domestic workers, uh, activists sought not an exit strategy but an upgrade strategy. One that advocated uh, not individual access but collective change. And their struggle is significant for thinking about how legal claims for rights were made. Domestic workers established an alliance with middle class women around a platform of revaluing household labor, which proved to be significant in the legislation's passage, as Phyllis Palmer has argued. Feminist activists drew attention to the home as workplace, uh, and by this they meant both women's unpaid household labor and work that was performed by pay, uh, primarily by women of color, for pay, pri primarily by women of color. Edith Barksdale Sloan, who headed the National Committee on Household Employment and was instrumental in the formation of the HTA, argued that were it not for low wages, domestic work would be a better occupational choice than factory work. She said in testimony before the House Subcommittee on Labor, quote, we are convinced that one of the major reasons why men and women choose monotonous assembly line positions in factories is they have little choice. A more rewarding, interesting job caring for an infant or toddler or elderly person simply does not command a decent living wage, end quote. By placing domestic work above monotonous assembly line work, Barksdale Sloan elevated the social value of the work. Carolyn Reed, who was a domestic worker who headed the, the HTA, similarly argued for its importance when she said, quote, I feel very strongly that I contribute just as much as, much, uh, just as much as my doctor contributes, and that because he is a doctor does not make him better than me as a household technician. The FLSA legislation, they believed, would, would rectify the long-standing legal exclusion, put domestic workers on par with other forms of labor, uh, and raise the status of their work. Doing so would earn them long overdue citizenship rights. Shirley Chisholm, Congresswoman and legislative sponsor of the bill, urged domestic workers at a national convention, quote, hold meetings and rallies, talk to the press, let everyone know that you're first class citizens and that you will not settle for anything less than a fair and equal chance to share in the fruits of this country, end quote. Many workers did indeed understand their push for the FLSA as part of the claim for first class citizenship. Their claims for rights and recognition of their work of social reproduction disrupted long-standing notions of both labor and citizenship and expanded the definition of worker that had been circumscribed in the 1930s. If the civil rights campaigns were intended to deracialize American political citizenship, then the domestic worker rights movement aimed to deracialize and degender the meaning of work embedded in American social policy. The passage of the FLSA amendments in 1974 was a significant victory. Indeed, the post-war period seemed to be one of racial progress indicated by the expansion of social rights of domestic workers, although they never achieved 
fully quality. Domestic workers are still excluded from the National Labor Relations Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, and civil rights laws. They did make some progress. In 1950, they won the right to social security assistance. In 1974, minimum wage. And in 1976, they obtained access to unemployment benefits. But the history of expanding citizenship rights in the US is more complicated than a narrative of progress. The universal promise of equal rights was and is premised on and enabled by unequal practice on the differential management of populations and cultural exclusions. The gap between the rhetoric of universalism and inequality generated by laws, regulations, and administration was a shifting boundary, which continually created new hierarchies and exclusions. Numerous scholars have argued that the dual trends of expansion and exclusion were mutually reinforcing developments. So the very freedom of those with rights was defined by and dependent upon the lack of freedom for others. So for example, uh, the, uh, the independence that undergirded arguments for universal white male suffrage in the early, in the early 19th century was um, contrasted with the perceived dependence and simultaneous restriction of rights for women and African Americans. The universal rhetoric that characterized citizenship existed comfortably with inequality and exclusion because of the way in which race, gender, class, and other forms of social distinction justified that inequality. As Partha Chatterjee put it, quote, citizens inhabit the domain of theory, populations the domain of policy. In addition to legal differentiation, cultural practices and economic inequalities also constrained the practice of citizenship. So even populations that had formal access to rights may not have been able to exercise those right, rights. Economic coercion, violence, as well as social and regulatory mechanisms limited the substantive meaning of rights. The example of the FLSA amendments illustrates how both cultural norms as well as legal limits continue to marginalize domestic workers. The amendments uh, excluded two important categories of domestics, live-in workers and home health care aides, who, as Jen explained, uh, along with babysitters, were, def were defined as providing companionship services and consequently were not real workers. After the passage of the amendments, home care assistance was one of the fastest growing industries uh, because of changes in health care administration and state funding patterns. Domestic workers, especially African American women, increasingly left private household labor for institutional employment such as home care work. Thus, they left one unprotected occupation only to find themselves in another unprotected occupation. The exclusion of live-in workers also became important with the influx of immigrants. As live-ins, these new workers were not entitled to minimum wage protection. So the legal recognition of the category of domestic work narrowed the definition and removed protections for some. The FLSA amendments attempted to mitigate inequality within labor law, but created new forms of hierarchy at the same time. In addition, the enduring belief in the public-private dichotomy made enforcement of the new law very unlikely. So the everyday practice is what we could call the micropolitics of domestic work, uh, the expected subservience, the degradation of the work, continued to create meanings about domestic work, race, gender, and labor more broadly. So the cultural production of domestic workers as less worthy and not real work uh, and not real workers, continued in the ostensibly private domestic sphere, and this was compounded by the fact that it was largely a non-white workforce. In short, because of the isolation of the work, the relative lack of social and economic power of domestic workers, they were, able, uh, they were unable to effectively exercise their rights of social citizenship. Another factor in thinking about whether or not the FLSA amendments led to substantive citizenship for domestic workers is to consider the shift from African American to immigrant labor. The 1965 immigration reforms created a growing pool of low-wage workers, many of whom entered the field of domestic service. As May Nye has argued, uh, it, 
In addition to allowing some new immigrants uh, to enter legally, the new law heightened the distinction between legal and illegal immigration, making those without documentation more vulnerable. As the American economy relied more heavily on immigrant labor, undocumented immigrant social rights were increasingly restricted over the course of the 1980s and the 1990s and came to cover welfare, uh, labor rights, health care, education, even the right to carry a driver's license. So labels such as illegal were used with greater frequency and people were criminalized simply for being present in a geographical location without proper documentation. Differentiation between the documented and undocumented immigrants and non-immigrants led to further marginalization of those engaged in domestic labor. Finally, uh, the FLSA amendments were passed at a moment when the substantive meaning of social rights for American workers more generally was being whittled away. A combination of inflation, unemployment, weakening unions, declining social services, and rising income inequality eroded the value of the minimum wage. Both the state and capital turned their attention to the values of neoliberalism and profits gleaned from globalization with waiting commitment to the well-being of the American people, whatever their citizenship status. Domestic workers won recognition as workers and minimum wage protection when the value of those rights was diminishing. The question of citizenship and rights as tools of regulation and population management raises the issues of new forms of difference and exclusion as well as political mobilization. In the United States in the 1970s, uh, the legislative victories were a product of a social movement and therefore I think it validated organizing by domestic workers. The case of domestic worker organizing suggests uh, that the possibilities for political mobilization exist in tandem with attempts to control and regulate. The struggle for citizenship rights remains an important counterpoint to state power. Over the past 20 years, we've seen an upsurge of activism among domestic workers globally in Uruguay, South Africa, Brazil, India, Mexico. Domestic workers have organized as informal workers or as part of the excluded sector. In many ways, the very marginalization of the labor force has fueled organizing. And movement leaders have largely, although not exclusively, campaigned for legal rights and equal social protections. In 2011, the International Labor Organization passed a convention on domestic work that for the first time established global standards for this occupation. So current organizing illustrates how, the, how legislative protection serves as an important political platform for domestic worker activists. But like the contradictory outcome of the 1974 legislation, the impact of the current victories also needs to be examined critically. The history of social movements in the US suggests there's a continual battle to stretch the meaning of citizenship rights. The outcome of these struggles is never guaranteed, uh, and it's not clear if there ever is an endpoint. Saskia Sassen's theorization that the inequalities embedded in the practice of citizenship can be characterized as incompleteness might be useful. The example of collective mobilization assures us that ordinary people and those who have been marginalized can have an impact on politics, law, and citizenship, even if they never achieve completeness. So contestation around the concept of citizenship is even more critical as the rights of all citizens contract in the context of neoliberal economic change. Okay, I'm going to be relatively brief since some of the main issues of uh, concerning domestic work are already on the table from the earlier session. Uh, these two excellent papers dovetail nicely, each concerned with efforts to dignify and upgrade the work of those who do paid work in homes, workers who had been explicitly excluded from the rights and protections granted other kinds of workers and ignored by traditional labor unions. I love that um, the first paper began with the um, evocation of the Memphis sanitation workers strike. This is Memphis all over again. We are somebody. We're men and women who deserve to be treated with dignity. 
Um, I found that especially striking because the mention of the Memphis sanitation worker strike immediately calls up for me the iconic images from that strike, which were men, black men, wearing placards that simply said, I am a man. Um, it just um, is obvious that women workers would not wear signs that say, I am a woman, because it simply does not convey the same uh, <laughs> certainty that that means I um, am deserving of honor, of respect, of the ability to take care of my family, all those sorts of things that the phrase I am a man uh, did convey. Uh, both of these papers include exhilarating stories of successful organizing by these workers and their allies, um, but they also include sharp reminders of how tenuous and short-lived such victories can be. Premila Nadison argues that domestic workers won rights under the Fair Labor Standards Act, at least some domestic workers did, just as the value of those rights was diminishing. And Jennifer Klein points out that a pending Supreme Court decision could roll back the progress that organized home aides have achieved. As both authors emphasize, although a variety of social rights have been attached to employment in the US rather than simply to citizenship, domestic workers, even domestic workers who are citizens, have not been treated like other workers. Their exclusion was, and to some extent still is, justified by the nature of the work. Since it takes place in private homes and is frequently done for free by family members, it isn't seen as real work. But the historical record makes clear that in the US, the exclusion derived at least as much from who did the work for pay uh, as it does to the nature of the work, primarily the work's been done by African American and other racial ethnic women and immigrant women. I think it's worth mentioning, by the way, that the social rights granted to other workers in the United States are comparatively paltry overall. Um, no sick days, no vacation days, only recently some unpaid time off for family care, no formal voice in the workplace, with certain exceptions, no protection from unjustified dismissal, a very minimal minimum wage. So we're not talking about um, domestic workers demanding access to a fantastic range of uh, social rights. Um, but they have had to struggle to achieve even the limited rights and protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Measured against the ideal of a society in which lives of, digni of human dignity and human flourishing are possible, the idea of, ideal that Jennifer Klein holds up, drawing on Martha Nussbaum's work, progress has been discouragingly limited. And these papers show that even this progress has been quite hard won. Pramila Nadison's paper demonstrates that domestic workers' struggle for inclusion should be seen in the context of African American struggle for civil rights, a struggle for recognition and dignity as much as for material gains. One way domestic workers tried to differentiate this paid work from enforced servitude was to relabel it, hoping that household technicians uh, would be granted greater status than maids and would feel greater pride themselves. Over time, the disrespectful use of girl to refer to household workers has faded, but highfalutin titles have had very little effect on changing the perception of the work of caring for homes and people. If anything, terms like uh, household technicians downplay the significance of the emotion work and the personal relationships that characterize many such jobs, features of the work that lots of sociological research has demonstrated can highlight the subservience of the job, but certainly can also enhance its satisfactions. Um, and these are the elements of the job that um, Jennifer Klein was pointing to as um, very significant in um, her argument about competencies. Um, certainly, the, um, it's especially true of the work of caring for children, caring for elderly people, caring for disabled people, um, that the caring relationships themselves um, can be a pleasure as well as um, a burden of that kind of work.
Madison argues that winning inclusion in the Fair Labor Standards Act was a hollow victory. Not only was enforcement difficult at best, but the value of the minimum wage and the protections granted to workers in general were declining just at the same time as their recognition was, was granted. Moreover, the act excluded the fastest growing segment of the domestic labor force, home aides, as well as domestic workers most subject to exploitation, live-in workers. Madison suggests, in fact, that new inequalities are typically linked to the expansion of rights, as the very freedom of those with rights is defined by and dependent upon the lack of freedom for others. Um, I wondered if you could say a little more about how much you would push that. Um, would you argue that that sort of differentiation of rights is inherent to the expansion of citizens' protections? Um, Jennifer Klein tells a relatively complicated story um, because home aids work has been defined by changing public policies and reliant on public expenditures to a much greater extent than other kinds of domestic work has. Klein emphasizes how much control the state has in organizing this kind of work, pretty much creating the occupation, determining who carries it out, poor women, um, what the tasks, what tasks it entails and how it's remunerated, even though the state itself has, uh, it's rarely the direct employer. Uh, she describes the enraging exclusion of home aides from legal protections through the differentiation of their role as companionship rather than work. But she contests Evelyn Nakano Glenn's argument about the unmitigated coerciveness of the conditions of care work, finding some historical exceptions and giving greater emphasis to workers' agency. Somewhat unexpectedly, I think, she both highlights the difficulty of improving home aid's working conditions because they are isolated, they're frequently immigrants of varied backgrounds, and they are dependent on government expenditures, yet typically not government employees, um, and demonstrates how these conditions have in some places given rise to novel, creative forms of organizing that create social worlds for the dispersed employees, um, and build solidarities between workers and consumers, and sometimes, in at least limited respects, even build solidarities between workers and employers. She begins in this paper to bring this labor history into dialogue with Martha Nussbaum's and Amartya Sen's argument that human well-being should be evaluated in terms of competencies rather than rights. But she calls for shifting the goal of independence to an appreciation of interdependence. Um, I wonder if she could say a little more about what the preconditions are for, the, for circumventing the positioning of the well-being of workers and the consumers of home services as zero sum. Uh, it seems to me that that is, um, while she provides some examples of that, um, it would be pretty rare in the American context, and so I wonder what idea she has about how the, con how the public conversation has been changed. Um, I guess I would ask um, both workers, um, I'm sorry, both authors, <laughs> both, both intellectual workers, um, to, uh, to um, discuss whether they consider it, um, they can see some possible paths um, toward bringing the care of children as well as the care of elderly and disabled people um, into the public discussion such that it would be recognized as a social responsibility rather than just as a freely chosen burden of individuals and families. Uh, and I also wonder what they would have to say about whether the improvement of the conditions of domestic workers can be put back on the civil rights agenda, um, and certainly whether it can be put back on the feminist agenda, um, since so often the, um, the needs of employed women other than, um, other than um, domestic workers are seen as being in contradiction to the well-being of those domestic workers. Anyway, I thought these were great papers. Thank you very much. Uh, do you guys want to respond? Um, no, no. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> right, I want to 
I'll, I'll, we'll just uh, respond to the first question about how far I would push the conversation about the, the inclusion of some dependent upon the exclusion of others by saying I'm a historian and historians do not make broad generalizations across time and place. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> We are very contextual, um, and so I would say that in my reading of American history, this is what I have seen in American history. Will it be like this forever? I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, in terms of the care of children, bringing that into the public discourse in terms of social responsibility, I think this is an extremely important issue. I mean, I think. Part of what's missing sometimes in the conversation, I mean, I think the issue of domestic worker rights is very important, but sometimes what's part, what is missing is that question of public responsibility. And publicly funded daycare, for example, might provide one solution uh, out of this conundrum of how to deal with the question of immigrant rights and domestic worker rights and the exclusions from this category of social rights. Um, so I think that conversation very much needs to be part of how we talk about care and how we talk about public responsibility associated with care. Uh, and in terms of whether or not we can bring uh, the question of domestic workers uh, and their rights back into the feminist agenda, there is a very vibrant movement going on right now in this country and across the world. There's a National Domestic Workers Alliance that has been organizing for the past 10 years. Uh, we've seen local domestic worker rights groups organizing over the past 20 years in this country that have really made a huge impact on the conversations about rights and revaluing domestic work. Uh, and they have formed important alliances with feminists, uh, including the National Organization for Women. Um, they have achieved a Domestic Worker Bill of Rights in uh, New York, in California, in Hawaii. There are pending bills in Massachusetts and in Illinois. Um, and in Connecticut. And, Connecticut. Um, and so I, I, and there was, a, you know, the, the convention that I mentioned uh, from 2011. Um, and so the movement, I think, has been uh, evolving and raising these issues about, especially the issue of elder care. The new campaign for the National Domestic Workers Alliance is called Caring Across Generations. And it's raising, it's, it's raising the issue of the aging of the American population and the question of who is going to care for seniors um, as they need more and more assistance. And so one of the ways to do that is to raise the value of the work uh, and to increase protections for the workforce. Um, okay, let's see. Um, and actually, I, I would add on to that in, in thinking about um, the care of children, which um, I would love to have some <laughs> support for that. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and again, it is, you know, one, how we make this a public conversation, how we make it a social conversation, that it isn't just, you know, the, um, uh, the, the responsibility of one individual. But recently there were hearings before the Connecticut State Legislature on a domestic workers' bill of rights. And um, one of the things that came out, and this was done in alliance with a Brazilian worker center and legal aid, uh, New Haven and Bridgeport, and one of the things that came out was um, tremendous abuse that happened in the home. I mean, shocking levels of abuse um, and wage theft. And so I think this links to two key um, issues that are, are starting to become um, uh, incredibly important to young people looking around, which is one, the question of immigration status and people's, you know, people's insecurity and the abuses that happen because of the, their insecure um, uh, immigration status and wage theft. And, and I think if we start to link it to a whole bunch of broad issues um, and see how these are all interrelated, that we can, you know, start to get um, a, a, an increasingly broader group of people talking about this. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, I think you brought up the question about the zero-sum understandings. I mean, what happens is this is quite literally how it's presented by the policymakers and also by the judges in these court rulings. I mean, Justice Breyer quite explicitly said this in the 2007 Coke case. He said, 
Well, I mean, if we were to include these people in, you know, fair labor standards and overtime, then millions of people couldn't get their care. And, and so I think, you know, the state actors have fomented this, you know, this fear. Um, and, and, and so that, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of close um, work to figure out how to get beyond that notion because, of course, it is tied to the public budget. And it's tied to the public budget that not only is supporting people um, who are disabled um, or who are poor, but is employing people who are poor. Um, and enabling them to see themselves in a range of ways. I mean, one of the things we saw, um, like, for women who were actually able to get on the California system in home support services, where you can actually um, uh, be paid, you know, through the public system for taking care of, say, an adult disabled child is, not only did they not know other people did this work, but when they started to actually have to fill out the forms and itemize the work, they, they would say, wow, I never realized how many hours of work I do. And that this really changed their understanding of it. And um, uh, so um, I think that um, in terms of thinking about, obviously it's, you know, it's a, it's a big kind of call to think about capacities, but you know, as soon as these issue comes up, I mean, I was speaking to various unions and they'll say, well, we feel like sometimes we have these allies with disability rights people or senior citizens, but sometimes you feel like they're our natural allies and they're not there with us. Um, and part of that has to do with this sense of, you know, asymmetries of power um, that, you know, the disability people feel that attendants or agencies hold power over them because again, if somebody doesn't come in for work that day, they don't get out of bed, and the workers see the relationship quite the reverse. Um, and so, for example, the United Healthcare Workers West did this really intensive education with all new workers to teach them the history of the disability rights movement, to teach them the history of the independent living movement, and to say, we fight this fight together. Um, we understand it you know, together, but we have to you know, think of each other. And so part of that is, I think, having the spaces for these conversations to take place. Great. Well, we only have about 10 minutes for questions, so why don't we take a few and then have the folks answer. So, the two of you there? Um, thank you for your answer. What's interesting about Iowa is that there's a Mm -hmm. so, like, so they say that I don't know, this wasn't really a labor day at the end, but um, well, my question is about, um, you know, the historical of 1974 when we distinguish elderly care from other forms of domestic work. And so, um, so this kind of 
think in the, I think in the interest of time, I'll, we'll just stop there, have you guys reply, and then we'll take a break. And if any of anyone else wants to ask any questions after during the break, it's fine. Do you want to go first, John? Um, quickly, um, in relation to um, Russell's point about the new rulemaking um, from 2013, um, I think one thing that you know was welcome was not only, of course, that you know they would now be um, covered by overtime compensation, but that it would actually now recognize that doing housekeeping tasks are part of the job of care. So it's both bodily care and housekeeping and traveling to different jobs because the other thing is that they never get enough hours to, um, to hold it together and make it. Um, on, uh, one of the other questions um, and about the movement and the strategy, I mean, the interesting thing I think about those, um, uh, the domestic workers movements that have been emerging in these other countries is there's a real party of the left Right, and you know, as Alina was telling me, I mean, they can actually really ally with you know a party of the left. But here, I think you know there 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 are these new there's the guest workers alliance and national day workers alliance, and and I think they are trying to think about you know these connections right to um, low wage labor. But in the case of the care workers, I mean, really their explicit strategy was to take the privacy, privateness of the home and make it public. You know, to really say that they're, um, you know, we're doing the public work of the welfare state and that the boundaries between private and public are really not that clear. Whether you're talking about retail or food service or hotels because, you know, these big box stores need permits and hospitals need permits and they have all kinds of federal funding and state funding and so in fact what we have to start to think about is the private is not all that private um, and then Kathy and oh and one other point I wanted to make was uh, organizations like J Fridge Jews for Racial and Economic Justice which worked as a partner organization with domestic workers um, union in New York to pass the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, you know, they took on the job of saying, all right, if people employ um, a person in their home, they have to come to understand themselves as an employer. And to really um, get people to say, if there is waged labor going on in my home, I am an employer and I have to learn to recognize what the, um, what the responsibilities of that are. And then, yes, I love that Kathy Weeks book. I know, it blew me away. I mean, I, I think she's totally right. I mean, why aren't we talking about, you know, a feminist politics of shorter hours? Why aren't we talking about having more ways that the market, or fewer ways that the market penetrates every aspect of our lives? And I'm... Um, so I, you know, I think, you know, I'm down with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a technical term. Yes, I, I agree with that too in terms of the Kathy Weeks piece. Um, in terms of just very quickly the uh, how uh, the movement responded in the 1970s to the home care exclusions, uh, this was a very, very hard fought battle for the domestic workers and so if, if I remember correctly, and Jen might know this, it was really two years later that the uh, administrative change occurred where the exclusions were actually solidified as policy, is that right? Well, yeah, yeah the, so. the amendments, you know, take, are passed in Congress in 1974 and then it's actually the Department of Labor that promulgates the rule yeah. in, in 1975. Right. So, so it didn't actually have to go that way. Right. Congress opened the door, but the Department yeah. of Labor yeah. made the rule. But I think most people in the movement at the time felt that the amendments themselves, even if they weren't uh, as strong as they wanted them to be, was an important victory. Uh, and, and, and the same, I mean, in terms of the current movement, they lobbied and fought very hard for the inclusions that, that ultimately took place last year. Uh, they testified on behalf of it, they wrote letters, they mobilized, so that was very much a part of their campaign. Um, in terms of the alliances uh, of the movement with, with, uh, with other sectors, the National Domestic Workers Alliance was actually instrumental in forming something called the Excluded Workers Congress a few years ago, where they allied with restaurant workers, taxi uh, workers, day laborers, uh, uh, agricultural workers, 
Uh, that has now been transformed from the Excluded Workers Congress to the United Workers Congress. And, the, and the, the thinking behind that is particularly the way in which you need to bring together all of these uh, informal sector workers who have been uh, excluded from or denied basic labor protections. And so I think there is very much a language of exceptionalism in the movement, but I think there's also a real understanding of the way in which that exceptionalism is becoming less exceptional for all workers all the time, right? Uh, it's not really an exceptionalism any longer. And actually, I would quickly add, one of the groups that um, was really fighting the 1974 amendment was actually um, uh, Restaurant Association. And saying, and they use it by saying, well, you know, we have all these women who are low paid waitresses, and now they would have to pay all this money for care in the home. And so instead of, you know, raising the wages of their employees, they basically said, well, they're low paid employees. They can't handle the, you know, the increase in, in, in wages. So. Great. Thank you. Please, please join me in thanking the panel.